Hey there, and welcome to a special episode in my guide series. I want to say it's still focused on the DLC, but at the same time, I'm also planning on, or I have planned on making this in a, such a way that it will benefit those without it. Uh, you'll also notice that I have omitted the quote-unquote new player focus of this one. This the particular episode will be covering and supporting everyone. I think that the stuff I'm going to cover in he this guide is going to be universally applicable. It's going to be helping you if you're brand new to the game and you want to learn some secret tech that will help you win a lot. Uh, this will benefit you if you are a veteran to the game and you're looking at a glimpse into what I'm thinking about when I plan a run and how I win runs. I, uh, I very frequently during my other series get comments in YouTube that are asking me, hey, you basically look like you're winning with virtually anything you want. It looks like I'm just kind of picking seemingly random things and just winning, and it doesn't make sense because when the, the players or the viewers are doing it, they don't see those same that same success rate. It almost looks like, how in the world is he doing this? I get those kinds of questions a lot, and I try to answer them, obviously, when they come up in comments, but I wanted to write down a list of essentially the 10 top tips, the 10 things I'm thinking about more than anything else that enable me to navigate a run from start to finish and win, essentially. So this is coming out of me seeing a lot of new player questions and content requests across various social media. I've been seeing it on Twitter, I've been seeing it on Reddit. I've also been seeing it in other players' Twitch streams where they're requesting insight like this. So I wanted to get a guide out there that covered this sort of thing. I felt I could provide some universally good insight here. So uh, that's essentially what's going on here. These tips are going to be tailored for the last Divinity DLC, but they will be perfectly valid in the base game too. A lot of those same concepts were how I was playing and winning virtually every run in the base game before I even started recording for YouTube. So even if you're just getting a new game and you haven't tried the DLC at all, this should benefit you regardless. And yeah, so these are going to be things that I mentally think about in every single run. And if you watch my other series, you'll notice that I actually talk about these all the time. I'm always doing this sort of a thing. And it may, you may even tune it out. You may not recognize that that's what I'm doing, but I am vocalizing them. So you can see it in my other runs. If you go and watch a few videos right after this, you'll see what I mean where I'm talking through, how do I do this thing? How do I do that thing? The other interesting point here is that while I could very easily pull together 10 tips that I thought were super important, finding the ordering of which tip was more important than which other tip was really, really difficult. Uh, it's very hard for me to identify, okay, this one is more important than another one. I think given another day, another little bit of thought about it, I probably could reorder things even more differently than this. So take it with a grain of salt, the order here. Basically, note that everything here is super valuable. You should probably pay attention to it all. I'm going to try to keep this video at a reasonable length so that it's, you know, something that people actually watch. But the order doesn't really necessarily matter. Some of these tips are going to be things that are useful all the time. Some of them are going to be very niche, but are still really important when they do come up. So yeah, I think that's all I've got. So hey, you know, as a reminder, do leave a comment with your ideas for other guides. If you see people asking for things, or you feel like there's a gap in the guide kind of technology or interest or just content out there, please let me know because I'm happy to create things. I'm obviously happy to share my opinions, but I'm also more than happy to provide insight where valuable. And I want to make sure I have these guides out there for people, especially as they're joining the game. So rock on. Uh, other things, of course, like the video, subscribe if you want to see more. I am doing a lot of this stuff. I am playing content series as well, just playing the game. And I'd like to think I'm okay at it overall. So hopefully you all find some value there. Uh, so let's dig, go ahead and dig in on this. I don't have too much else to say up front. So yeah, I will jump in on number 10. So number 10 is the... I don't want to say the least important. All of these are going to seem really important, but this is the one that I think at the bare minimum you want to start with. And the thing I want to talk about here is that Monster Train is a no, is a game at its core about a knowledge check. Okay, I'm going to pop open the logbook here and see if I can navigate to where I'm looking for. Okay, so there is some secret tech in this game that 
Monster Train is not very good at tutorializing. And there's some things that it's really good at. For instance, if you play the new clan in the worm, the Wormkin in the DLC, you'll notice that there's a whole great tutorial on how charge decos work and what that UI element looks like, and it's great. But cool, that's one of the only things that's good at tutorializing. There are some elements of this game that are just super critical. And I've known some people, I've, I've seen people on Discord servers that have played this game for 400 hours and didn't know some of these things. So I'm going to attempt to identify the most important secret tech here for you real quick, because knowing passing this knowledge check is probably the first thing you can do to being better at the game, because you just kind of need to know how things interact. So let's see. So the first one is pretty obvious, I think. If you are a veteran player, you've heard me talk about this, and it is something called draw priority. So Draw priority is a unique mechanic that applies to banner units in a clan. Now, what is a banner unit? Essentially, any unit that can come out of a banner. You know the banner because it shows up on the map, right? If you click that little banner icon when you're on that node, it will show you some options. Just looking at Hellhorn, for instance, it's going to be Branded Warrior, Horned Warrior, Railbeater, Steelworker, Alpha Fiend, Demon Fiend. It's six units per clan at the uncommon level and three units per clan at the rare level. So Apex Imp, Deranged Brute, Consumer of Crowns. These nine units have draw priority, which means they behave a specific way. And there's gonna be nine for every single clan. It's the same across. You can usually tell because they're roughly two space, they have abilities, they do things. There are some extra ones in the clanless side as well that I think are important, specifically Dante and Hef. You can identify these because they are units that are coming from events, the caverns, right? They also have mutators where you can start with them as your champion. And that's another way that you identify them because they're special. So these two are also draw priority units. And that's all of them. So nine per clan and Hef and Dante. And let me describe what draw priority is then for a moment. So the idea is that at the start of every turn, the game will look at the remainder of your current deck pile. So all the remaining cards in your deck, and it will add a draw priority unit to the top of your deck. It will guarantee that you draw it as the top card until there are no further draw priority units in your deck. So let's say I have three units, Branded Warrior, Horned Warrior, and Railbeater. On turn one, it will add one to my hand, guaranteed. I could still draw the others, and so you might have two or three in your hand, but you're guaranteed to have one. And on turn two, it will then look at the remaining cards in my deck, and if there is a draw priority unit in there, it will add it to my next hand. And similarly, for you know, turn three, turn four, if you have a ton of units or something. And the important tech here, the secondary important tech is that if you redraw your deck, so it's only looking at your deck pile, it's not looking at your discard pile. So when your discard pile reshuffles, if on any given turn, there is a draw priority unit in your draw pile specifically, it will add it. So even on a redraw, you have draw priority. This means that if you draw through your deck fast enough and you drop a unit the first go around, you can reasonably find it on the second redraw. And it will show up on, you know, turn four or something, depending on how big your deck is and how many cards you're drawing, of course. And so I think that is a super critical, important thing to understand. It's not explained anywhere in the game. If you hover over this unit, it doesn't tell you to draw a priority unit or what that means or how that does anything. So that's critical tech. The next piece of critical tech I'm going to talk about here is if we look at common cards. This is something that I hear about all the time. People don't realize this. Common cards, so there are Let's see, excluding the starters, so right, Torch, Queen, Zempling, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight common cards per clan. These cards only show up in the first two rings as common card drafts. So you will only ever see them in rings one and two as card rewards for both your primary and your secondary clans. This is super important because these cards are often formative. That's a word I use a lot when describing this. But essentially, they're cards that define how your run is going to look. For instance, an imp run where you see Welder Helper is very different than an imp run where you miss Welder Helper. 
An imp run where you see Fledgling Imp is very different than one where you see Welder Helper. Meanwhile, a run where you see Fledgling Imp or Ritual of Battle as offensive scaling options is very different than one where you don't. You might lean into these if you have them. Vent is a very good AoE card that addresses backlines, and it can solve a lot of problems in the DLC, especially if you're fighting the Divinity, where the enemies have five enemy waves. How do you kill them? Well, Vent with a plus 30 and holdover could solve two or three of them, and then you only need units that can punch the others. So it's all about addressing the threats, and common cards do that in all clans, by the way. They're super critical. All of your starting clans. You should always be clicking these common cards. Some of them, at least. Sometimes they won't make sense, but you should always be clicking them. They oftentimes are balanced to be stronger than uncommons, and you only see them early. This is really important, okay? You just don't skip these cards, all of them. If you walk out of rings one and two without a single common card, your run is probably going to lose, because either the run is absolutely horrifically doomed, and you just saw no good ones, or you're, you just made bad decisions, basically. And that is the second piece of hidden tech I wanted to cover. The third hidden tech, and this one's going to go a little quicker, your champions have special draw behaviors, okay? It doesn't say it on the card, but you're, you will always have your champion in your, top, in your top deck on the beginning of a combat. And it has essentially a hidden intrinsic keyword attached to it. So this is usually something pick up, people pick up pretty quickly. Oh, I always seem to have my champion in my turn ones. But I do see a lot of new players asking, hey, I've been getting really lucky and just hitting my champion. That's pretty cool, right? No, it's not luck. The game is guaranteed to give you your champion. And this is important because you can oftentimes play a strategy around sacrificing a champion to protect other units until you draw into your draw priority units or maybe your champion is a main part of your line if it's very powerful or something like that but you can always plan around seeing it on turn one and in most cases that is a very strong benefit so keep that in mind there are a lot of strategies in the game that only work because you're guaranteed to see your your champion on turn one even in a large deck so and these are just some examples of secret tech. Beyond that, there is so much information in this game, especially with card interactions that I think matter. One that I'm going to call out because I like talking about it is, where are you? Nexus Spike. You can break the game with this card, for instance. There are a lot of really interesting interactions here, and I could make a separate guide video, and I probably will, about just simply breaking the game with Nexus Spike. And this is just one case here where understanding the niche interactions that can go into this card and what's happening here can be super important so there's a lot of stuff like that in the game where how do two cards interact in a specific way what can i do what are the synergies what are the combo pieces here uh, some other ones that might be useful you know like shroud spike how am i enabling that what is that doing for instance which i pull it up real quick for you so you can see it there's shroud spike there's a lot of stuff like this understand the cards and you get this through experience watching people play, stuff like that. So that was a long one, but I think learning the secret tech of the game is absolutely critical to success in the game. So I wanted to cover it first. Now, my next piece of secret tech here, it doesn't really matter what I look at card-wise, but if we simply look at some units, I think basically draft fewer units, then when you're really good at the game, you draft more units. And this is weird, but think about this in terms of skill level throughout playing Monster Train. When you're first playing the game, you probably don't understand draw priority. You probably don't understand what you're looking for, how to scale, what scaling even is, things like that. So you're going to draft a lot of units. You're forced to play Awoken with Hellhorn, Hornbreaker Prince on your first run. Almost everyone's playing like, I got like Thorned Hollow with an Awoken Hollow, an Animus on another floor. I've maybe got a Horned Warrior somewhere. And then my champion is there. You've got like three floors and five banner units. And you're just like, yeah, click these things. You don't know what's happening. It's okay. 99% of players lose that first run. This is the statistics are wild in that respect. So, sure, it's okay. But you start by playing those early formative runs while you're learning the game with too many units. You should basically never have more than three banner units, three different banner units driving your run. And that's, that's a loose suggestion. The thing is, is that 
you need to understand that the way monsters rise or you know enemies rise on the train you're forced to encounter the first wave on turn three which means you need the you need sufficient draw consistency that you've assembled your you know floor clearing strategy by turn three and that means drawing the right banner units so based on draw priority you might not see it until turn three especially if your deck is larger or your draw power is lower so in those universes you want to drop off how many units you're drafting now token units which also exist in this game like these imps for instance if i just kind of click imp here and i type it in drop the rarity let's see look at commons and uncommons or whatever all of these imps like welder helper molting imp fledgling imp impish scholar pyre chomper even transcend imp right they're all they're not draw priority units so you don't necessarily need to stop clicking them like you can have a big imp deck that's very strong the ones i'm specifically re referring to here are those draw priority units you know horned warrior branded warrior steel worker etc you want to make sure you can assemble your floor in time so you're going to stop taking as many units you're going to draft fewer get down to like three and then when you get really good at the game you're going to you know start aggressive you want to avoid tunnel visioning certain winning lines because you might not see the other pieces that you need to make it win, right? So for instance, you tunnel vision the, oh yeah, I have big branded warrior behind, I don't know, steel worker or something, and I've got an imp in front. It sounds like it works, and it does. But what if you never see multi-strike at a shop? What if you never see a relic that supports this into something like Chase Seraph? What if you just never kind of see the pieces you need? And... So you only take these two units, you lack the flexibility to adjust your run based on what you're shown, and you actually lose as a result of it. So this is kind of at the high end of the gameplay. Once you've gotten really good at the game, you start losing a lot more. And you're like, geez, how do I help that? The answer is you're going to start drafting more units, and you're going to just remove the ones that you end up not needing. You'll see me, for instance, drafting things like Animus of Will, even though I probably won't be using it, simply because the possibility of using it for a multi-strike infusion here is really strong. It might be an important line. So it just adds versatility to my run. And I value consistency very highly, and it's important for win streaking, right? I mean, you need to be able to look at your run and say, I can win from any position, basically, regardless of what I'm shown. And taking kind of helpful cards like Animus of Will, even if they don't end up being important to my run, and then just removing them later if I don't need them, is really good. So you'll notice I actually draft way more banner units than most players at this at like the high end at Covenant 25. And it helps me win because I have more options. And so that's what I'm getting at, right? You're going to draft fewer units to get better at the game. And then once you get good at the game, you're going to suddenly start drafting a few more units to add flexibility to your runs and then clear them out towards the, you know, ring eights and such to make sure you have the draw consistency you need. So that is number nine, which is a very important one, I think. This next, this next one is really important to me, and I, I debated making it much higher on the list because this is, I think, some serious elite tech that everyone should be thinking about. I hear a lot that... Yeah, I, I, this is going to come up in a couple places here, actually. It's the, oh no, I missed multi-strike frenzy stone at a shop, I lose. I made a whole video on this, by the way. Go find it. It's in my guides playlist it's a it's excellent video i think and it covers this in extreme detail but suffice it to say that i think locking yourself to needing to see specific upgrades at shops is suicide it's how you lose this game because you say okay i just need to hit multi-strike and then i do that thing and the game's easy right great you might hit that multi-strike and that run might be great but what if you don't how do you win without it and that can be really difficult so I'm going to tell you, this piece of elite tech and this big suggestion here, diversify your shops. What does that mean? So basically, you want to avoid accepting only a small subset of the upgrades at shops. Think about your large shops, your steel shops. You've got large stone, endless, quick, and multi-strike. When you walk into a steel shop, the more of those that are good for you, the better off that steel shop is guaranteed to be no matter what it rolls. I always, whenever humanly possible, try to walk into steel shops where at least two of those four upgrades are good. Because statistically, you're so likely to see one of the two that you want 
that it's almost impossible to miss. You basically have to hit exactly two to avoid the ones that you want. And if you can walk into a shop needing three things from it, you always hit. You always see value there. And so I, units that represent value with these different types of upgrades are really important to me. And you, you notice if I did that top 10 card video recently, you know, it's also in this guide channel, something like Titan Sentry, I value as one of the strongest units in the game. This thing says revenge, apply frostbite three to enemy units. It is two space, has 35 life. This dude takes large stone and this dude takes endless extremely well. I tend to snap click this unit even when I don't need it because what if my shops say endless large stone and they don't say multi strike? How do I win? Well, I can still win runs using Titan Sentry by self infusing it with its own ability and then just sticking endless on it. So if the game is doomed and I never see multi strike, but I see an endless, I can still win. This diversifies my shops and is a great way of improving consistency at winning the game is don't lock yourself into the mentality of I just got to hit multi strike and because then you get mad when you miss multi strike and it's like the game feels bad. But no, the game is trying to teach you that you don't need multi strike. You just need to play better to find ways that can win without it. So uh, we'll talk about multi strike more later in this episode, this guide, because I have a lot to say about it. But essentially, you know, diversify your shops, find units that are strong without it. another great example of this tombed uh, tombs and imps, right? So we go to tomb, we'll go to melting, drop the rarity thing. That's wormkin. Okay, yeah, tombs are a great example. They take endless really well. And they can be very strong winning lines. Similarly, imps do the same thing over there on the Hellhorn side. You know, ignore Apex Imp and Consumer of Crowns here, but you know, the other imps actually are really good. I'll, I'll tend to grab Endless even if I don't have a great imp, just because having Endless can represent tons of value later. So keep an, keep an eye out for the really strong ones here, the strong secondary diversification options. All right. The next thing I want to say, and this I don't have a great example of how to show this in the logbook, but basically I want to say that size is multi-strike, okay? Probably the best way of looking at this is in Stygian. You can see that there are some rare units that are totems. They are one space. And what I want to say here is that there are a lot of ways in this game of getting size decreases. There's things like Hef's Consolation out of a Ring 3 event that normally gives you Wingmaker. It reduces the size of a unit by one. There are There's a minor refraction hit out of the Cavern event that's usually showing up on Rings 3, 5, and 7. You've got... Uh, you can infuse things into smaller units. So for instance, things like you can make... You, you see, actually, there probably is a video of me doing this somewhere on the channel. Look for Votivary here. Votivary is a one space unit, and Votivary is really strong as a result. You don't, she doesn't have draw priority, but if you can put an offensive scaling line into Votivary and make her kill things, she's really strong because you can just make more of them. And that's the point, right? You know, I say this a lot, but making a two space unit into a one space unit is essentially the same as giving it multi strike, but way better because, for instance, you can fit more AoE abilities on the floor, which scales you faster, and comparably you can simply you don't even need to see a multi-strike in a shop anymore it doesn't matter you have small stone or whatever so i always hunt down lines like this i mean think of another great example here draft where is this friend he's right here draft this thing's nuts one space has multi-strike built in and the burnout is oftentimes an advantage i will snap click draft on a lot of cases it's one of the th reasons why melting is such a strong clan in my opinion is the access to a one space multi-striker that you can just stick banner units infused into and make this your carry so yeah i think that's really important understand that size is power here it's also why there is no infusion in the game that reduces the size of a unit i can i know that for sure there's none of them because it's too strong right it, it's way too strong and this also goes the other way too, and it's why I say size is multi-strike, because if you can hyper-increase the size of your floor, so for instance, we go over to Penumbra and look at Architect, things like Intrinsic Space Prism, the champion, Mr. Architect here, or just Intrinsic Space Prism itself are really powerful, and space can sometimes be a force multiplier, because it doesn't matter if you have multi-strike, just put more of your things on the floor, 
and it essentially hits more times, right? There are going to be runs where you don't see multi-strike the classic frenzy stone or whatever just miss i guess but you just jam a bunch of crap on your floor and you still hit the number of times you need and the number the amount of damage you need to win so keep that in mind size is multi-strike my next tip uh, let's see if i can remember the number here i did a 10 9 8 7 so we're now on number six my sixth tip or rather number six hyper fixate on strategies so I don't have a great example here other than hover over rage. I oftentimes see people being very scared of something like Chase Seraph, right? So once you have your identified winning line with all the answers, nothing else really matters. You don't need to keep clicking cards. In fact, clicking cards is bad because it hurts the consistency that you see the pieces on the right turns to win. This could be important to draw your imp in time, your fledgling imp, for instance. This could be important to hit your holdover ritual of battle or whatever you're doing. Maybe to set up your last stand multiplying on your rage stacking, basically, right? So at this stage, once you've identified that line, you should probably focus on just removing the chaff from your deck and finding ways to draw faster. So draw relics. For instance, you only, it's one of the reasons why the way I see the boss relics, for instance, is you only take the space or the ember that you need to win and everything else should just default to draw relics. They're strong as hell and they draw you to your important cards much faster. And another piece here and why I talk about Chase Seraph specifically with Rage is that you can overpower and beat the Seraph that would normally beat you by hyper fixating like this. So you can get rage lines that overpower Chase Seraph. I do it all the time, right? It, you don't have to be scared and go, oh no, it's Chase Seraph, I can't play this. No, just play it and go go ham, right? You just need to understand how are you outscaling Seraph? How are you going faster? You could have small, low spell decks still overpowering Diligent Seraph. You could simply just don't even play spells, right? You just take tombs and you play units constantly and that kills diligent seraph even without the requisite number of spells in your deck to avoid them all getting burned how important are your spells at all and you can even chump block patient seraph and just rally the hell out of him sometimes i take my seraph up to i don't know like 80 attack but it doesn't matter because i was just like leaning hard into days or something so seraph has 50 days he never hits me it doesn't matter if he does 100 damage or not and it doesn't matter if my frontline has 12 melee weakness if it kills everything. So it's, it's all about just hyper fixating. You'll notice I do this a lot. Once you have the pieces, you just focus on that line. And what I consider a doomed run, you see I have a whole series about it, is the run where you don't see the pieces. You don't have the line until the very end so you haven't been able to focus those are the hardest runs for sure because your deck has a lot of crap in it and you're just trying to piece together a winning line so yeah hyper fixate on strategies number five this is a quick one i think know your strength uh, this also plays into just simply be aggressive right i think people oftentimes skip trials that they need to be taking in order to win and the the TLDR here is your last Pyre HP. Number one is the only one that matters in the end. I will almost always click unit trials. I, ver I basically take them no matter how much Pyre damage I'm taking. Just so long as they don't kill me. I have 40 life at the beginning of a run. I can spend 39 of that on unit trials and things. And I'm happy to do so. Because even if you don't see the unit you want necessarily... It shows you an option. It gives you the chance to see that line. And the earlier you find a line, the stronger you can become because just like I, we talked about, you can hyperfixate earlier. And that means you remove a bunch of crap and you become strong faster. Really good. I will very rarely skip unit trials. Pretty much always click them. There are rare circumstances. You'll see them on the channel sometimes where I skip them. You basically just need to evaluate, does this unit trial actually just end my run? And you, you obviously skip it in that case. It feels bad to do so because it puts you behind in a big way, but it is really important to be able to identify that. I also have a whole video guide on knowing your strength and understanding power levels. It's like an hour and a half. It's really long. So go watch that if you're interested in way more detail on this. And let's see. So now number four, the number four top tip here is plan ahead. So planning ahead, I don't have a great visualization on this either here, but if you imagine the map nodes, this is something I do at the beginning of every single run. 
I open up the map and I look ahead. I'm asking myself a few options, a few things, because I plan my runs really early. I'm asking myself, where are my temples? Where are my shops? Where are my dupes, my hell vents? Because those are great. And then where am I getting my pack shards? I will notionally kind of fill that out. It's like, oh, I have a late game temple. That means I can backload my pack shards. Or, oh, I don't have a temple after rank four. I have to front load them, which means I need to be stronger earlier. Or I'm going to take a bunch of relics because this clan combo has some great ones and they could be really valuable, you know, Wormkin or something like that. Or I need to see a specific relic answer in order to win. So maybe I'm being forced down an Umbra line. What banners are coming up? This can be important because, for instance, I consider Umbra fairly weak in the DLC, really good in the non-DLC. And you might be shown a forced two Umbra banners. And in that case, I'm going to say, okay, if I'm forced down the Umbra line, I need to see relics because I need to find things that can keep morsels alive into the end game. So you'll see me tunnel vision those relics and plan around that. Trinket shops become suddenly more valuable. Where do I jump in strength the most is another one that I kind of pay attention to. And you'll see I know I mentioned this by dupes, right? This is going to be another one later on, by the way. This is one of my top tips. I'm not going to spoil it too hard here, but uh, where do I jump in strength? So this can be where I'm picking up a ton of pack shards and just going ham. This could be, for instance, the moment when I self-infuse a Siren of the Sea in an incant line and then immediately dupe it. So that increases my strength by a ton because you get an infusion and then you get another one. And then where do I need my line identified by? Usually this will be ring four is the drop dead moment because you don't see banner units after ring four. Um, spoilers for, I suppose, the hidden tech. That's another decent one, but you can at least see that on the map, so I didn't mention it before. But yeah, you need to have your line identified pretty early so that you can lean into it. The earlier, the better. And this is something I could reevaluate throughout the run, right? So it's not something I have to have figured out immediately, but I'm constantly looking at the map and planning ahead. And I think that is an important skill that will benefit you both as a new player and as a player looking to improve your win streaks. So... Hell yeah. Uh, number three tip coming up next. This was an, these top three, I think, are like hyper important. And I've reorganized these a lot in order to kind of lean into them. And I think I want to talk about them a lot. Still, I don't want to spend a million hours. We're already at 32 minutes, whatever. Uh, number three, focus chiefly on the next combat, not the last combat. It's easy to get lost in the sauce, right? That's a great way of looking at it. You're like, oh, yeah, I, I have this. I picked up, what is it? Frenzied Swarm, and I'm going to put, I found Holdover for it, and I need to keep Tethys alive on, on Divinity, right? So I have a Holdover Frenzied Swarm, but I need to keep Tethys alive. Oh, no, what do I do? I put an Intrinsic on it. Sweet, now I have Intrinsic Holdover frenzied swarm awesome but you're also doing this so early you don't have the ember to support that frenzied swarm or maybe you're playing incants and because it costs one ember now you're incanting very slowly and i've seen this in so many cases where someone will click that divinity solution on like ring three and then they just lose to Talos. They're like, hey, what gives? Why did I lose to Talos? That doesn't make any sense. Run sucks. I had the answer for the divinity and I didn't win. And, and truly, it's easy to get in on that. I, I strongly kind of support the opposite version of this, which is take power when it's shown. But you need to own, you can only do that when it actually doesn't kill you. You'll see me do this, right? I'll talk about. I would really like to take this pack shard upgrade, but taking it doesn't add enough power right now, and it increases the enemy's difficulty and means I probably lose. So I will skip pack shard upgrades or other upgrades in general if I need something else for it. Another great example is I will avoid taking a mediocre magic shop upgrade, like a double stack that's kind of okay and maybe has value later but it doesn't really do much for me now. I will skip that so I have more money walking into an upcoming steel shop, which is more important to my run. If you just kind of go ham and spend all your cash all the time, you can't plan around those upcoming shops. And I think planning around when you're spending your money, it matters a lot in this game, especially for consistency. You want to be able to spend and re-roll shops. It's very important because the game's not going to hand you everything and you can just lose if you miss the important stuff. So 
I will say focus chiefly on the next combat. Another great example of this, in my opinion, and I'm going to call it out specifically, Crystal Cloak. People oftentimes will remove all of their train stewards before ring five, and then they go, oh no, stealth boss is BS. What a stupid design decision. Bad game. Why would they ever make a boss that does that? Dude, the game, the boss is checking your defense, and you just removed all of your defensive options. You just need to delay the boss. If your run is not very defensive into something like Crystal Cloak, leave some train stewards in. Remove some other stuff, right? And then you can play the train stewards to bait like four rounds, and maybe that wins you the run, right? You see, I do this all the time. I have things like, oh, I have an endless Titan Sentry. Great, I can disrespect the hell out of Crystal Cloak. That thing's just going to steal all of the stealth turns. Or maybe I don't, and I'm like, all right, well, I've got five, four train stewards in, plus like a random unit that I'm just going to slap down. I'm going to throw a bunch of imps in front of her, and we're just going to do our best. And you just need to answer that next combat so you're not losing, right? You can't just walk into ring five and go, I don't know, just don't hit Crystal Cloak or I lose. Yeah, that's not consistency, right? That's really rough. So you can do better. And I think you need to, especially if you want to push to higher win streaks or get more consistent at winning. So focus on the next combat. All right. And then number two, this is something I pointed at earlier. You want to duplicate, you want to duplicate your force multipliers. So what the hell is a force multiplier? Basically, a force multiplier is something that is so strong to your run and having another one scales your entire line by just a factor of two, right? You just, going from one to two of them just makes you crazy. A great example of this, if we go to units and we go to rares on, what is it, Hellhorned? I've been talking about Hellhorned a lot lately, but this applies to all the clans. But Apex Imp, for instance, this dude's got multi-strike and quick from a shop. He slaps, right? But you know what? Having only one of these, you don't win the run, right? Because you need multiples, in, or maybe he's even infused with a steelworker, right? the dream you can't lose from that position but you need to duplicate your force multiplier and the force multiplier in this case is simply the unit itself having more of them and this is one of those opportunities where you, you might be able to have four or five units because you can't have too many of these things you could set up on multiple floors or whatever it doesn't matter and you're just looking to scale and especially because it had the steelworker infusion we just kind of pull that up real quick has an aoe effect resolve apply friendly unit armor five to friendly units. So having more of them is really good and you want to stack them. So you may take things like space to get a third one on the floor. You may take things like sketches of salvation and have four of them and they just all pop out immediately. There's a lot of stuff there and you want to just duplicate your force multipliers, whatever they are. Sometimes they're a spell, maybe your conduit Tethys, right? And you have ancient synergy and this, this ancient synergy has a minus two or like it's conduit tetha, so it doesn't have minus two. It's a plus ten in piercing and hold over. Make like four of these spells, and you win the run, right? You just want to m multiply the thing that is powerful for you. And oftentimes, you need to understand: is this thing actually better when I have more of them? Like, for instance, frenzied swarm with hold over is a very good defensive line. Duplicating this does nothing because it, the, one, the first one you play du discards the second one that you have in your hand. So it's pointless. Whereas something like that, Tenon Piercing, Holdover, Ancient Synergy, if that's the only spell you play every turn, you're going to win, right? You crush. So have like five of those in your hand, you just slam. You have an incant unit, you win. Have no unit walks on you, right? So it's really important to identify what the strongest cards are and how do you make and fit more of them into your run obviously this is something unique to monster train compared to other roguelike deck builders the game makes hell vents and duplications very accessible and i think that is so strong so lean into that if you're not at least taking one hell vent in a run your run is either going to lose or your seat is terribly cursed there is something worth duplicating in a run almost always it's so regular just go look at some random videos of mine and in a run that's not doomed see that I'm duping something somewhere. I value things like removal dupe pathing very highly because removals increase consistency and duplicate increases density and duplicates my force multipliers, which is you know, a double whammy of a huge power swing for me. So yeah, that is number two. And all right, you probably saw this coming. I told you to expect it. I think 
the number one thing that a player can do in Monster Train to improve consistency is to get it out of their head that they need to see multi-strike to win. I made a whole video on this, but you should win every run as if you are never going to see multi-strike from a shop. This is how you achieve the 100 win streak. This is how you get these numbers up really high. There are so many ways to see multi-strike. I'm not going to cover all of them. You can get them from infusions, right? You got like Animus of Will, Horned Warrior or something. You can get them from spells, One Horn's Tome. You can get them by simply, it's quote unquote, multi, like multiplying a unit by making it smaller because size is multi-strike. We talked about that earlier. You can do, you can win the run with spells and then a crappy unit in the back. I have a run on the channel somewhere which is just a completely unupgraded first of kin behind Echo Right, and I win by playing like a double stack siren song every turn. And I just send units to the pyre, they die to the pyre, and then I win relentless seven, 70 damage at a time over like 700 rounds or something. That wins. That's a winning run. I missed multi-strike on that run. I had nothing. And I just said, all right, I'm going to solve the run another way. That identification of that line is so important to consistency in this game. It's easy to be like, I don't know, he hit multi-strike. All right, fine. And there's another run recently I put up where I essentially missed multi-strike, but I planned my whole run and talked about it as if I wasn't going to see it. And then I saw it and it made the run easier. And that's great because I had to think a little less. Cool. But what if I had missed it? I still would have won. That's the whole point. So TLDW, win without multi-strike. You don't need it, though it does help. Obviously, some lines are riskier than others because they are more reliant on multi-strike, right? But think about like the Umbra line, right? What if your run is terrible on Umbra? You can just self-infuse Alloyed Construct and this thing hits three times. You could miss every Frenzy Stone. That's enough. All you got to do, maybe you find Trample instead, right? Let's drop out Aldi Strike here and go look at Umbra Stone real quick. Where are you at? Umbra Stone, Trample. I don't know. Just make the number really big and then you just cleave all your damage through. Maybe you have a Trample Sweeper and you never see Multi-Strike. You can still win with that. So win without multi-strike is probably my number one tip. It, obviously, this is the last one in the video, right? Because you can do it. And if you plan your run as if you will, then you're going to suddenly win a lot more runs. And you're also going to feel better playing the game because you're going to look at a shop and go, eh, I missed multi-strike. Oh, well, I didn't need it. I already won. So, and that feels good. It's, it's definitely a point of pride for me. It's the realization that, oh, I actually understand how to win this game because... This isn't the end-all be-all. I don't have to hit that multi-strike. So, and yeah, all right, go team. Uh, this episode, this guy did get a little bit longer. We're at 43 minutes roughly, so I will call it here. I know most people kind of filter out and stop listening around the half an hour mark, but hopefully this has been useful. Like I said, you know, you, if you have any other ideas for guides, you should pass them on my way. I'm happy to run them. I will be doing these periodically as they become useful. And, you know, when I have the ideas for them, pretty much is the driving force. So, yeah, so hey, that's all I got for you. So thanks a lot for watching this. I really appreciate your time. As always, you can give the video a like or a dislike if you want. You can subscribe to the channel if you want to see more. And stay tuned for what's next. Take care, folks.